psalm. And this superscription to the psalm is simply for the director of music, the Psalm of David. Uh, let's turn to verse 1, where it says, The fool says in his heart, There is no God. They are corrupt, their deeds are vile. There is no one who does good. The Lord looks down from heaven on all mankind to see if there are any who understand, any who seek God. All have turned away, all have become corrupt. There is no one who does good, not even one. Do all these evildoers know nothing? They devour my people as though eating bread. They never call on the Lord. But there they are overwhelmed with, bread, with dread. For God is present in the company of the righteous. You evildoers frustrate the plans of the poor, but the Lord is their refuge. All that salvation for Israel would come out of Zion. The Lord restores his people. And Jacob rejoice, and Israel be glad. Look at your neighbor and say, The fool says there is no God. as we deliver the psalm help us father to deliver it with precision with power with anointing may your son be glorified may your presence be known may your greatness be found may your glory manifest in this room even right now may all the atheists silenced by your word and by your goodness amongst your children. In the mighty name of Jesus, amen and amen. My Bible talk today is one which every pastor should pay attention to, every person who preaches, and any person who is going to represent God. It's concerning the existence of God. In Christian apologetics, there are certain arguments which we hold dearly pertaining to the existence of God. I'm not going to give you in detail, but you need to make sure you research in your free time. These are pertaining to the existence of God. The first one is called the cosmological argument. In this argument, we argue the existence of God from the origin of the universe. As believers, we believe that God created the universe and that the universe requires a cause or explanation, what we call the first cause or the uncaused causa. We believe that God is the uncaused causa of the universe. And um, evolutionists and atheists believe that nothing created everything that the world came from nothing. We believe that God plus nothing made everything. They say nothing plus nothing made everything. I don't know which mathematics makes more sense, the mathematics of the Bible or the mathematics of the world. The second argument is called the teleological argument. It's called the argument from design. This argument suggests that the complexity and the order of everything observed in the natural world imply the existence of a designer. That when you look at how everything is well designed in the world today, every organism, just looking at your body, there is no way that could just happen randomly. There had to be somebody there had to be somebody who thought about that because everything that you see, there has to be a designer there. If you look at this stage, someone had to think of where everything goes. We didn't just come here and suddenly everything was in place. There has to be a designer. For everything you see, 
there is a designer. There's nothing in this room that wasn't designed by somebody. There had to be an intelligence behind it. Number three, there's what is known as the moral argument. That's another important one you need to pay attention to, pastors. Uh, this argument states that for there to be moral values and duties, there has to be a moral law giver or a source of moral authority. This was uh, Ravi Zacharias' favorite debating point when you go to Ivy League universities. That the fact that we have moral absolutes, where we believe that stealing is wrong, everybody protesting today, whether you're pro-Palestine or pro-Israel, what is making your heart say that Palestine is wrong or Israel is wrong? Whatever your position is, there's something in your heart which says someone is wrong. Where does that feeling come from? Animals don't feel that way. They eat and slaughter each other every day. They, they, they don't start protesting. You've never seen the zebra say, ah, the lions, it's too much. You've never seen the elephants complaining that, no, oh, the crocodiles, it's... What is it? There has to be a lawgiver above which every human being knows in their hearts that something is wrong and something is right. We say that comes from God. Atheists have no argument for the morality that's in every human being. They can't explain it. You can't. Then number four is called the ontological argument. And this argument says that the very idea that there can be a concept of a God a being that is beyond us, just the, the idea of there being a God, which we all generate as human beings, points to the fact that within us, we've all got a conceptualization of God or some type of supreme being. That is in natural in every human being. And then the final two are just... Um, I'm adding them to the, other, to the other ones. The first one is called the fine-tuning argument. Um, it's part of the teleological argument. Um, and it focuses on how everything around us is fine-tuned for life. If you look at the planet Earth, everything on Earth is conducive for life. If there just wasn't a little bit, not enough sunlight, we would freeze to death. If the earth was just closer to the sun by a few inches, we would burn to death. Are you hearing me here? It's too fine-tuned and perfect for life for it just to be random. There had to be somebody who makes it proper. Fine-tuning is involved in everything. If you ask musicians, they have to tune their instruments. The instruments just can't play themselves. If you ask the sound man, he has to fine-tune everything so that it's at a certain level. God has fine-tuned the universe so that earth is perfect for life. It shows that there has to be a God. And then the final one is connected to the ontological, which is the universal intuition. When you look at every culture throughout history, whether they're in New Zealand, whether they're in Brazil, whether they are in Europe, every culture historically has had some type of concept of God. Every culture, without, before there was the internet, without agreeing, every time you land in any culture, they've got some type of God they're worshipping. Every culture. You go to China, there was Buddha. You go to Europe, the Greeks had Zeus and all these people. You go to Rome, they had Jupiter. You go to Norway, they had Thor. You go every culture, you go to the Mexicans, they had their own gods. And it's because God has written his existence in the heart of every person. God exists and God is real. But the fool says in his heart, there is no God. Are you hearing me here? Psalm 14 
is an examination of the atheist's heart. It's an examination of the heart of an atheist and also God haters, people who hate God. In this psalm, we're going to see the root issue of why certain people do not believe in God or in some cases believe in God but actually hate God. It's not an intellectual issue. It is a heart issue. Wilson says Psalm 14 is a mediation on the foolishness of the wicked who deny the existence of God. Montgomery Boyce says it's a psalm about atheism, both theoretical and practical atheism. Later on, I will explain the difference between theoretical atheism and practical atheism. If you have brought your physical Bible as a good Christian, you can turn to Psalm 53. Psalm 53. I'm reading from the NIV this morning. Right. Keep your finger on Psalm 53 and Psalm 14. Psalm 53 says, The fool says in his heart there is no God. They are corrupt and their ways are vile. There is no one who does good. Turn to Psalm 14. The fool says in his heart there is no God. They are corrupt, their deeds are vile. There is no one who does good. Go to Psalm 53 verse 2. God looks down from heaven on all mankind to see if there are any who understand or any who seek God. Psalm 14 verse 2, the Lord looks down from heaven on all mankind to see if there are any who understand and who seek God. Are you seeing the pattern? Word for word, Psalm 14 and Psalm 53. It's a repeated psalm. Are you hearing me here? which means that there's something special that God wants you to know about it. If God says it twice, there is something he wants to say. There's a pastor friend of mine I speak to, whenever I'm talking to him on the phone, he says, I hear you twice, I hear you twice. And I'm like, what do you mean? He says, no, it's something in my culture, you won't understand. So when I say I hear you twice, it means I really understand what you're saying. So there's something that God wants us to understand right here. So let's go to uh, verse 1. Verse 1. I've divided the psalm into three stanzas. Verses 1 to 3 is fools. Verses 4 to 6, fighters. And verse 7, presents. Let's go look at the fools in verses 1 to 3. David begins Psalm 14 um, in a no-nonsense mood. He has no desire to be politically correct, nor diplomatic. And sometimes as modern-day Christians, we're very politically correct and di diplomatic when people are lying about God right in front of us. Sometimes we're, we're even shy to stand on the truth of the Word of God. When someone is literally telling you to your face something bad about God, you actually smile and let them continue. We need some people who are willing to stand for God in this time. People who can tell them to their face, we don't worship ancestors. Ancestors are God. We're not shy. We don't care if your name is Gogo go, or whoever. If your name is Deben, Gogo, go, 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 whoever you are, we'll tell you to your face. There is only one mediator between God and man, and that is Christ Jesus. Are you hearing me here? He's got no desire to be politically correct when he says, the fool says in his heart, there is no God. The word fool there is not pertaining to intellectual capacity. It's not about intelligence, but it's actually about intellectual dishonesty and intellectual depravity. In that David in the psalm is going to show us how original sin has corrupted 
all areas of a man, even the intellect of human beings is fallen and depraved. We were never meant to use our intellect to prove that God doesn't exist. Our intellect, when we're studying the universe, when we're studying science, it's a way to engage with what God has created. The, the role of the mind is not to prove that God doesn't exist, but it's there to express the glory of God throughout his creation. God is so holy, faithful and true, that to even say there is no God is an external manifestation of internal intellectual depravity. In other words, God is so sovereign that even how he starts the Bible in Genesis 1, he says, in the beginning God. From that, he sees no need to rationally explain his origins apart from his testimony of himself to us. He doesn't tell us where he comes from. He just says, in the beginning, God. I am God. Take it or leave it. I'm not going to explain to you where I came from, what I was doing. Just know I am God. In the beginning, I was. And because we are finite beings and God is infinite, uh, what we know about God has to come from God's initiative to reveal himself to us. And God's revelation of himself to man takes two forms. There is general revelation and special revelation. General revelation is what he reveals to all mankind. And special revelation is what he reveals to individuals. The general revelation of God or God's self-revelation to man is usually through nature, history, and the inner being of mankind. The general, general revelation of God through nature and history is an indictment against atheists. Psalm 19 verse 1 says, The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hand. Nature every day is pointing to a creator. Every day the sun rises every day, preaching one message. God is faithful. God is faithful. God is faithful. Every day, every day, every hour, you are faithful, O oh Lord. God is faithful. Whether you messed up, the sun is rising again. Whether you made money, the sun is rising again. Whether you lost money, the sun is rising again. Whether you lost a friend, the sun, every day, the sun has a message of God's faithfulness. Every day, the sun is showing us God's faithfulness. No matter how highly educated you are or how rich and famous you are, if you say that there is no God, the Bible doesn't negotiate with you. It calls you a fool. And it's the, the use of the word fool here makes this psalm take on a wisdom pattern, a wisdom psalm character. In Psalm 1, which is the introduction to the Psalter, we told you that all throughout the book of Psalms, Psalm 1 and Psalm chapter 2, the themes in those two psalms are going to keep repeating all throughout the psalm. And Psalm 1 being a, a wisdom psalm and Psalm 2 being a messianic psalm. So in the psalms, you're going to see the wisdom of God and the Son of God. So here in Psalm 14, we see the doctrine of two paths from Psalm 1. The doctrine of two paths says that there's only two ways to live life. Life is binary. There's only two paths. Jesus said, Jesus repeated this theme when he says, wide is the path which leads to destruction, and narrow is the path which leads to life. There's only two paths in the earth. Everyone in here, there's only two places you're going, heaven or hell. There's nowhere else. Everyone in the earth today, there's only two places everybody is going for eternity, heaven or hell. And right here, the wisdom psalms 
always tell us that we must walk on the path of obedience to God. And fools are those who deny God's authority over their lives and choose to walk in disobedience on the path of sin, which leads to destruction. Sin always leads to destruction. No matter how sweet, no matter how fun, no matter how entertaining, sin always leads to destruction. So the fool in the psalm is the ungodly person from Psalm chapter 1. And David here says, he says in his heart, there is no God. And that is an atheist statement. And Jacob believes that the atheism in view here is known as practical atheism. Practical atheism is when someone might acknowledge the existence of God in their mind, but choose to live practically like there is no God. There are some Christians who are practical atheists. They know there is a God, but they practice a life, I am my God. Like there isn't a God. Practical atheism. You've got a concept of God. One theologian calls it demonic faith. Because the Bible says the demons acknowledge that there is a God, but they function like there isn't a God. Devils know there is a God, but how they conduct themselves in the earth, it's like there is no God. Are you hearing me here? And uh, the people in the original audience in Israel would believe in God, but there were certain people in Israel who would start to follow other gods and say there is no God. But Montgomery Boyce, I agree with him. He says the psalm applies to both people who are practical atheists. These are people who believe that God exists but live like he doesn't exist. And also theoretical atheists. Those are people who say, they say, they believe there is no God. And they live accordingly. There are some people who intellectually argue that there is no God. And they say, they believe there is no God. And David says, you are fools if you say that in your heart. This is an amazing statement by, by David when, because what David is showing us here is that atheism makes you a fool. Atheism makes you a fool. It's not an intelligence issue. Behind every atheist, they always want to sound so smart and intelligent when they're disputing God, but they look very foolish. But God is saying it's not about their intelligence. It's about their heart. Atheism is not an intelligence issue, it's a heart issue. Because the fool says in his heart there is no God. Why? Why does God consider it foolish to say there is no God in your heart? It's because in the heart of every human being, by design, God deposits the truth that there is a God. So the fool has to lie to his heart every day that that longing in their heart that they feel the need to worship can be filled by something else. Even that feeling of anger when you see injustice, when you see evil, that feeling in your heart, you have to lie to yourself that that feeling doesn't come from God. Because God is a God of justice. And he has put within every human being a desire for justice. So anytime you see something wrong and you feel like it's not fair, that person must be arrested. That's an attribute of God. The way he sees sin, sin must be arrested. So when you say there's some preachers who've lost their minds, and are saying that hell doesn't exist. When you're saying hell doesn't exist, you're saying at the end of life, the devil must win. At the end of life, all the rapists must walk free. You're saying that at the end of life, all the evil and unjust people 
must walk free. But God is a God of justice. Evil will not win in the end. Are you hearing me here? The sense of morality in our hearts comes from God. And you have to lie to yourself that it doesn't come from God, it comes from me. Even guilt. Everyone battles with guilt on some type of level in their life. Because everyone knows that one day we shall stand accountable to someone for all the wrong we have done. You have to become a literal fool and lie to your heart that there is no God. Look at your neighbor and say, I'm not a fool. Mama ain't raised no fool. Amen. So as we indicated in the intro, Psalm 14 is repeated again in Psalm 53. And actually, Paul repeats the psalm in Romans 1, verses 18 to 19, when he says, the wrath of God is now being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of people who, watch this now, suppress the truth by their wickedness. Since what may be known about God is plain to them because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities... His eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen being understood from what has been made so that people are without excuse. So what Paul is saying here is that in the hearts of the ungodly, they live in a state of suppressing the truth of the wrath of God being kindled against sin. And he uses the cosmological argument the teleological argument and the ontological argument as the basis of the intuition in the hearts of all human beings. Paul is saying that all human beings by the virtue of existence in God's creation inherently know that God exists. But due to the presence of sin, the fallen man in the wickedness of his heart suppresses the truth of God. They suppress the truth of God in their heart. Why? Because man in his fallen state of sinfulness does not want to submit to God. The natural condition of man is to rebel against God. Man in his heart doesn't want to submit to God. Why? Because man wants to decide for himself what is right and wrong and hates the idea of submitting to a being's authority to decide what is right and wrong for his creation. Fallen man despises the fact that one day he is going to face God and be judged for his sin. So in his heart, man wants to de-God God and make himself God. That's why in this world, there's just so much self-centeredness. You just have to watch um, music, particularly hip-hop music. There's just a lot of self-centeredness. I'm the baddest. I'll take your, I'll take your girl. I'll, your, your dream girl is in the... I, I've got your dream girl in your dream house. There's a rapper who said they had a song called, I've got your dream girl in your dream house. Why are you listening to that? You're being insulted and you're there. I've got your dream girl in your dream house. Hallelujah. Self-centered. Man seeks to deny God's right to rule over him and loves to rebel against the rulership of God. And many times when we look at people in the world who are ungodly, we think it's because the church is not entertaining enough or the church is not welcoming enough or relevant enough, or we are not telling them enough about God and how God wants to bless them and make their lives so happy. That is a wrong assumption rooted in Pelagianism 
which is the belief that everyone is inherently good and all they need is a little bit of good advice and they will come to God to help them be happy. The Bible teaches what is known as original sin, that after the fall of Adam, every man is now corrupted. At his core, man is not inherently good and man doesn't need good advice. Man needs the gospel, the good news of what God has done in Jesus Christ. Not to assist him. Jesus didn't come to assist us. He came to save us. Because to assist means you could do it. You just needed a little touch. I just need a touch. Touch. I just need a touch. You needed to be saved. Because by yourself, evil only comes forth. Are you hearing me here? Oh my goodness. For those with beards, you know that if you don't go to the barber every week, your face will look different. Hallelujah. For those who are married, you know in the morning, the breath which was in the evening is not the same as in the morning. Are you hearing me here? The person next to you, overnight, the breath has transformed. If it is not maintained, that breath the whole day will test your marriage. Are you hearing me here? We are not naturally good. We need God not just to assist us, but to save us. And the issue with a lot of people in the world who are not in church today is the sin in their hearts makes them not want to have nothing to do with God. Those people who were partying last night are very happy in the groove. They don't want to be here. They love their sin. They love their alcohol. They love their BBLs. They love their bubbly pipes. They don't want to be here singing Siabonga. They don't want to be here. They hate it here because God is going to tell them, let go of that marijuana. Let go of that fornication. Let go of that mess. They hate it here. They love it there. Can I tell you a story? In 2000 BC, around the time of Moses, I had a girlfriend before I was married. I went with this girl to a bride. She was, the first song dropped. Oh my goodness. She was dancing, dancing. I think it was Jaru. Every little thing. She was, ah, she was dancing all day, all day. Then I said, okay, uh, tomorrow come to church. The whole service, she was like this. Immediately I knew that I don't have to die to go to hell. I just must marry this person who comes alive in the club but is dead in the presence of God. There's people like that. They just hear that log drum come in. They, they, they already start. Are you hearing me here? They just hear that log drum kick. The, there's a joy. It comes from here. But in church, they love the world more than they love God. Some of you, oh my God, will deal with that another day. It's the fallenness in our hearts that suppresses the truth that there is a God. And they foolishly say there is no God. The fool says in his heart there is no God. This statement is actually a key part of the gospel. Why did Jesus get killed on the cross? Why did they kill Jesus? When he came to earth, he fulfilled the law. He never broke the law. When he came to earth, he performed signs and wonders. Jesus was the kindest man. You know, a lot of people say, 
Christians are so mean. Why can't you be like Jesus? Worldly people, I prefer Jesus than the church. That same world killed Jesus. The kindest, most compassionate, caused problems with no one. The fallenness in their hearts couldn't stand him. He performed signs and wonders and proved that he was the son of God. But the fool said in his heart, there is no God. The sin in their hearts suppressed the truth which was right in front of them. Instead of accepting Jesus, instead of supporting Jesus, instead of standing with him, they decided to suppress the truth with the biggest act of foolishness on earth, which was to crucify the Son of God. The fool said in their heart, there is no God. So they suppress the truth. And there's some people like that. You can walk in the room. They can see God is working in your life. They can see that God has called you. They can see that you are the one who's meant to be promoted. But the devil and the sin in their heart makes them suppress the truth. And instead of anointing you, they crucify you. The crucifixion of Jesus is the greatest act of foolishness in human history. It was the act of fools suppressing the truth in their wicked little hearts. Why was Jesus crucified? He was sinless, which means he was innocent. But they unjustly killed him. Fools suppressed the truth. They even had an opportunity, choose Barnabas or choose Jesus. They chose Barnabas. The fools chose Barnabas. Suppressed the truth. And they dragged the truth and decided to, to whip the truth. They tore off the beard of the truth. And they put a crown of thorns to suppress the truth. You are the king, but we shall suppress it. Oh my goodness, with these thorns. What crime did they accuse him of? The religious leaders accused him of blasphemy. Don't you see that that's a foolish accusation? Because blasphemy is they are accusing him of saying, you are God. He was truly God. Oh my goodness. But the foolishness in their hearts suppressed the truth. They could see that this is the son of God. But the sin nature in their hearts said, no, we cannot submit to him. He will come and take our power. So they suppressed the truth. And that's what worldly people feel like in a service. I cannot go to church. They'll take away my enjoyment. I'm having so much fun. I'm having so much fun sleeping around. I'm having so much fun messing up my life. They suppressing the truth. That there is a pleasure that is found in Christ, which the world can never satisfy. There is a fulfillment that is found in God, which no amount of alcohol, no amount of party can match. It's, it's not even close. But the enemy suppresses the truth in their hearts. That God's way is the wrong way. God is holding you back. All these laws he's putting, he's trying to stop your enjoyment. He's trying to stop your fun. No, God's way is the best way. It's like evangelist Pressure said, it's so much better his way. God's way is better. The world's way for dating is horrible. It always ends in tears, breakups, and all types of rubbish. But God's way of love, building family, building a community, working with integrity, working with honesty, building your family, building your life, it brings peace, it brings fulfillment on every level and on every stage. Are you hearing me here? Why do you get shocked when you find a news report that an artist is now accused of rape? And now he has to pay money quickly to silence. Do you know the stuff they do behind the scenes which you don't hear in the music? Ungodly stuff. Are you hearing me here? And it always leads to pain and destruction. There are some artists who are on their eighth wife. 
married, divorced, married, divorced, married, divorced. There's one guy, I think he's got how many? 15 children with nine baby mothers. Confusion. If he just married his first wife, according to the Bible, had built a family, he'd be, he'd be at peace, his children would be at peace, his wife would be at peace, and they would be even more wealthier than what they could be right now. Just by simply obeying God's way. God's way is better. They knew Jesus was God, but the sin in their hearts suppressed the truth. And in their foolishness, they tried to suppress the truth. And this is where the power of the gospel is. They didn't know that in their sin, committing the greatest act of foolishness to suppress the truth, <coughs> they were actually reversing the previous greatest act of foolishness in human history, which was committed by Adam in Genesis 3. The foolishness of the fall of Adam was reversed by the foolishness of the crucifixion of the second Adam. Fools suppressing the truth in their hearts. The first Adam fell because in eating the fruit, he actually blasphemed against God. He wanted to be God. And the second Adam rose from the dead because he didn't see it wrong to not want to be God and be man. The other one fell because he wanted to be God. The other one rose because he was willing to humble himself and take up human flesh. He was the sinless lamb of God without a spot of blemish, but he was still nailed on the cross. Sometimes you can do all the right things and still suffer. And Jesus is showing you that this world is fallen, that even the righteous sometimes go through pain, go through difficulty, go through injustice. But look at how good God is. You know the God haters who say, why does God allow suffering? Because he loves us so much, he gave us a free will. But what separates God from every other God is that I'm not going to allow these people to suffer alone. Since I have allowed free will, and their sin is going to bring suffering. I'm willing to taste the same medicine I'm allowing them to endure. I'm going to leave heaven and endure suffering too. So that no one can point a finger and say foolishly that how can he allow suffering? I can clearly stand, I suffered too. I came and suffered without sinning without doing anything to anybody. I was killed and I suffered on that cross 10,000 times more than 10,000 jobs. I suffered the wrath of God on your behalf so that when you come into my presence, you know we are talking to a God who has suffered too. Suffering is not just, it's not pain and suffering, it's not just some psychological puzzle for me. It's an experience I have shared with my children. Are you hearing me here? Adam truly blasphemed against God in Eden, but he walked out of the Garden of Eden untouched. But Jesus, who was truly God, took on himself the crime of blasphemy of Adam, and he got nailed in his place. And when Jesus rose from the third day, he proved wrong all the fools who said in their heart there is no God. He proved them all wrong when he rose and defeated sin and death. Their act of foolishness against Jesus reversed the act of foolishness by Adam. They were really foolish because they were in the presence of God, but said in their hearts there is no God. And now through that act of foolishness, we now have a message which Paul calls a foolish message. When he says in 1 Corinthians 1.18, For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but us who are being saved, it is the power of God. 
their act of foolishness has given us a foolish message. It's foolish to people who are perishing. It's foolish to people who have said in their heart there is no God. Not only is our message considered foolish, but it's delivered through a mechanism which is also considered foolish. Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 1.21, it is the foolishness of preaching. So not only is the message foolish, but the method of delivery is considered foolish. But not only is the method considered foolish, the messengers are considered foolish. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. Are you hearing me here? The gospel is a message of a foolish act, reversing the foolish act of Adam against God in Eden which was reversed by the foolish act of crucifying Jesus Christ. And now this foolish message must be delivered by a foolish message, by foolish messengers to confound the wise who are actually fools, who say in their hearts there is no God. But do you want to really know who fits this verse the most? The fool who said in their heart there is no God. The biggest fool who beheld the glory of God and suppressed the truth of who God is in his heart. The greatest fool in history is Satan. He was in heaven, in the throne room of God, beholding the presence of God. And he said in his heart there is no God. He committed the greatest act of foolishness in trying to kill God. He is the biggest fool who said in his heart, there is no God, and he reaped the consequences. And now on earth, he is recruiting fools. He's looking for fools to say in their heart, there is no God. But when Jesus rose again, he rose up and said, all power in heaven and earth is given to me. Now go and preach this foolish message and watch me turn fools into kings. Are you hearing me here? Oh my God. There's consequences for decoding God. There's consequences for walking away from God. And David shows us in that same verse that when we walk away from God, he says they are corrupt, their deeds are vile. There is no one who does good. Anytime we rebel against God, our hearts begin to walk on the path of sin and bad things happen. Just look at South Africa today. The more godless we become, the more chaos, the more death, the more destruction, the more load shedding, the more problems we have. As we become more and more godless as a nation, the more trouble we have. At the heart of corruption, are fools who are saying in their heart there is no God we can do whatever we want we can be as greedy it doesn't matter about the poor the needy there is no God this is our money when you see the scandal in Northwest where they built a fake uh, call center in a shack for 38 million why did that happen there were fools who said in their heart there is no God we can do whatever we want. There's no consequences. And not only is the government corrupt, but we've also got corruption in corporate SA. They are very self-righteous, but they too are corrupt. When you think of the currency manipulation scandal of the banks, even the lack of racial transformation on board appointments, it's rooted in the heart of fools in boardrooms who say in their hearts there is no God. We are our own gods. We are rich. We can do what we want. We are white. We are gods. We can do what we want. There is no God. We are the gods. Then in verses 2 to 3, David says something about God when he says, The Lord looks down from heaven to all mankind. And this is a, a powerful theological statement. He says, The Lord looks down from heaven to all mankind. And this statement is not geographic. God is not up. 
God is everywhere. God is not up. This is not a geographic statement. It's a theological statement to establish the difference between God and man. He says, God looks down from heaven. It's not, it's not saying God is in the sky. It's talking about the glory of God, that his glory is far above the glory of man. His glory is far above our existence. So that whenever God looks at mankind, he is so high and lifted up in glory that he is actually looking down. God is so high and lifted up that when he looks at mankind, it's an act of humility. He has to humble himself. Oh my goodness. He has to humble himself to look at these creatures who think they are so smart, who think they are so special. They only live for about 70 years. They have no power to control the currency. They have no power to control the wind. They have no power to control the weather. But they can question me and think, I am, think they are smarter than me. They can't even read a full book. They can't, they can't even, oh my goodness. The distance between God and man, it's an act of humility for God to even notice. Are you hearing me here? That's why Jesus was given the name above every name. Because if just looking down is an act of humility, what more coming down? What kind of humility was it for Jesus to leave heaven, to come to earth, to leave the glory of all the angels and to take on human flesh, to walk and live among us, to live all the glory of eternity to come here. The mere fact that Jesus came down from heaven was a huge act of humility. You'd be shocked how many Christians struggle with humility. So much pride, so much arrogance, can't serve, can't help, can't pray for others. But he chose to be humble. Not only that, he chose to stay in a poor family. His family wasn't rich. He didn't stay with King Herod. He wasn't even born in a hospital. He was born in a manger next to animals. The king of the universe. Born next to animals. You were born in a hospital. He was born next to Umbuzis. Are you hearing me here? And he stayed in a poor city. And he lived a very simple life. We are the flashiest Christians in history. This is a generation of flashy Christianity. If Jesus was here, he wouldn't be flashy. He would be so humble, so simple. He would wear the most simple clothes, drive the most simple car, live in the most simple place. He won't be up here saying, Jesu, Jesu Kiman. Are you hearing me here? He humbled himself. That's why Paul tells us in Philippians 2 verses 6 to 7, who being in the very nature of God did not consider it equality with God something to be used for his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant being made in human likeness. This is the spirit of true Christianity. Making yourself nothing, dying for others, humbling yourself, making yourself of no reputation, no need to puff yourself up, because you know that only God will lift you up. And not only did he choose to be humble, he chose to be humiliated, insulted, stripped naked, beaten to the pulp with whips, given a crown of thorns and raised up on a cross between two thieves, left bleeding from head to toe, humiliated by fools suppressing the truth of who he really was. And yet there are fools who can look at that cross and see how much Jesus suffered and say in their hearts, God doesn't love me. God doesn't care for me. God has abandoned me. How foolish do you sound? God will not come through for me. After he's done all of that for you, how can you not have faith in him? 
of how far he can go. He looks down on mankind and says, is there anyone who understands? Is there anyone who seeks God? How many of us look at the cross and understand what Jesus did? And it, and it inspires us to live for God. A lot of us today, we look at this verse and say, yes, there are people who understand the gospel and seek God. That is us right now in church. We are the ones who seek God. And in verse 3, God disagrees. He says, all have turned away. All have become corrupt. There is no one who does good, not even one. There's no way that God can be saying this to us in the church. He must be still referring to the foolish in verse 1, who say in their hearts there is no God. But when you look at verse 3, God is lumping us all together with people outside the church. Because he wants us to know that the human condition of all mankind is fallen. And without him, we would be the same as the people out there. Without the grace of God, you would steal as much as any politician. Without the grace of God, you would, do the, you would be like the Nazis and kill the Jews. Without the grace of God, you would do the same as apartheid did to us. Every man is fallen, and all our hearts have a sin nature. Whether we're in the church or out of the church, we should never be self-righteous. We must never downplay the seriousness of our condition. God is reminding us here that we are all fallen and we need His grace. As much as those who are not saved, we can't point fingers at them. We can't point fingers at them and judge them. We must work on our salvation with fear and trembling. We mustn't think that our works are good enough to save us. They'll never be. It's by God's grace. You can never stand before God and say, God, you owe me. God will never owe you. He paid the biggest price. He paid a price you could never pay. We must always know it's by grace. And our hearts mustn't suppress the truth that we need God. Are you hearing me here? Let's stand. Look at your neighbor and say, we need God. Where are you today in your heart? As it relates to God and how you live. Do you live your life in ways that reflect that you believe in God? Or do you live like there is no God? Where are you in terms of self-righteousness? Do you know that you are saved by grace, not works? That the reason why they say there is no God, their hearts are fallen, and it takes the power of the Holy Spirit to transform a heart from loving the things of this world to loving God. You cannot force someone to love God. Those who love the world, they love it. You can see it in their eyes. The joy that they have when they are there. And then you bring them to church. They are stiff as rocks. They don't like it here. And unless the power of the Holy Spirit breaks through their heart and makes them born again, and it's only through delivering the gospel to them where the Holy Spirit is going to change them. Your job is just to preach the gospel. God's job is to change them. You have no power to change someone. It's the power of the Holy Spirit that changes people. It's not us. So we don't give up on people. We preach the word promiscuously to everybody from the drunkard to the sober, from the good to the bad.